What's up and welcome back to Now Stouch Pod, giving you another week of what's going on in pop culture. My name, as always, is Pat Sheehan, joined by my trusty co-host, Dave Martin Swagger. Dave, what's what's good this week? He's in the club, because your love got me fucked up, man. FKA Twigs from the clouds, out of nowhere. Love to see it. That's what's <laughs> up. Yeah, shout out Twigs, giving us uh, some content to talk about this week. A uh, strong, strong music week, I'll say. We're going to get to, uh, I, I think, three albums that I would say I was pretty pleased listening to, as well as, I think, some solid TV. And uh, I'm excited to hear your review of an anime film that you went, you were able to catch this weekend. But Dave, I wanted to start, as we have so many times over the last couple of years, talking about the lineups of the festivals that are coming out, the major ones. And this year feels particularly important because Coachella dropped their new lineup returning this uh, April after uh, attempting to move the festival last year. Um, A couple festivals did it successfully. Coachella did not. It's coming back to Indio. We got Harry Styles, Billie Eilish, and Ye headlining as well as I mean, the lineup is just freaking stacked, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even really. I mean, Megan the Stallion isn't even a headliner. Like she's mm-hmm. like number three on, on her day, which is just insane. She headlines every other festival. Uh, uh, so, Sunday we got Yay, Doja Cat, Jamie XX, which is just always good because you know that we're mm-hmm. going to be getting a Jamie XX album soon. Uh, shout out to Mag- Maggie Rogers uh, on that top, that second line of Sunday. Yeah. Like, wh- what's going on there? <laughs> uh phoebe bridgers up there i mean this, this griselda is... line five on sunday <laughs> they barely performed I, together i i don't know but i mean i guess i want to start first of all general thoughts in the lineup but you know state of covid right now it's hard to even mm. say if these festivals are going to happen Where, what would you put the odds at right now that coachella is actually going to go on this year I'd say pretty high. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think it'll be pretty pr- pretty solid. Uh, they had a lot of other stuff during the Delta wave, which in, was a little bit more serious than what's going on now. Also, we're seeing stuff cresting and peaking already. So come come April, I think it'll be fine. I'm sure they'll have a vaccine mandate of some kind, but. Yeah, I, I'm not too worried about it happening, and it's definitely a, a stack lineup befitting of having a few years without said festival. So that that makes sense. But glad to glad to see that. There's a lot of uh, people that you want to see right now, and that's exciting. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, Harry and Billy alone are people that you know don't do a ton of performances. Uh, Harry, I guess, just did a tour. So that I mean, yeah, he, he just did a, a huge he just did a world tour. But uh, getting them together is massive in and of itself. And then you get Ye returning to Indio, and he he's had two very different, like, memorable experiences. He did the Sunday service a couple of years back, right. and then that hill that he had them make in uh, the, the desert. <laughs> Such a random stage setup, and then obviously the My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy headlining set which is just, you know, legendary and uh, very memorable at this point. I have a lot of hope that this Yay headlining, uh, especially after his last album got some some critical critical success, some Grammy uh, love. Maybe this is going to be Yay doing some of that, uh, you know, inventive uh, stage design, uh, coming up with some, some crazy show. Uh, stunts or something like that to really make it a memorable experience hopefully something uh, a bit over the top like my beautiful dark twisted fantasy not the sunday service for my liking um you know i think one story here and something that's meaningful to both of us is brock hampton announced that (laughs) this is going to be their last performance together as a group uh they're playing on saturday uh april 16th and 23rd just what do you think about that? I mean, is this really the end of Brockhampton as we know it? They say all kinds of shit that they don't mean, <laughs> but I'm not surprised. Um, but it only feels like a month ago they were talking about like 
working to release some of their unreleased stuff that people really hyped on like that uh those like a puppy album and team effort albums and stuff so i really don't know where the fuck they're at half the time honestly but who knows honestly if you look at their run it's like six seven, seven albums in like a five year span wow. four years or four and a half year span it's they've earned the break but i mean they're so uh inconsistent in their messaging that i i, I think we just have to wait and see yeah it's uh i think the only piece of it that feels a bit like this might be actually the end of brockhampton as we know it for now is that they did talk about giving refunds for their other show dates and canceling yeah. those so if that that's actually happening talk. there's some kind of hiatus probably on the horizon um just want to shout out two or i guess a couple other things on the lineup here um baby keem uh second line on friday good look for our guy huh that kendrick uh association Bump. paying dividends my friend <laughs> uh, yeah and you know yeah good i'm just looking him. i'm looking here a saturday and man i mean <laughs> just looking a couple lines down you got rena sawayama on the fifth line of that day oh yeah really? fifth line what she's doing songs with fourth elton line. john and shit how is fifth she fifth line, yeah. line? hell makes yeah. no sense that'd be sick. um 100 gex is here mm-hmm yeah, yeah, Saturday, I think, is Big the day, day to Which go, Brian. honestly. But, man, every day is stack. Can't go wrong. I'm jealous of all those that will be in Indio. Give us your thoughts on the lineup. Any, anything else to say about Coach Ella, Dave, or should we you look at on? the bottom of the poster featuring 88 Rising, Head in the Clouds Forever. They've been doing the Head in the Clouds uh, festival the past few years out in L.A., so I'm curious what th- exactly that means. We know there's another 88 label group album on on the way i imagine it's something to do with many of the signees and uh swedish house mafia a big deal about them we've kind of known they're on yeah. the comeback trail the past few months with some singles and stuff out but um i'm sure that'll be a big to do as well yeah uh swedish house mafia glad to have them back maybe we'll get an album maybe we'll talk about it but dave why don't we move on to an album that we did get an album that uh i think we knew was coming and we were excited to listen to because Corday is back with from Bird's Eye View. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, what was your your hype for this? Were you anticipating it? Were you looking forward to it? Yeah, I was definitely looking forward to it. I wasn't as hyped as I think I previously was. It had been some time since we've gotten this. The debut album was back in summer '19. And then we got that like holdover four pack EP April 2021. That was already kind of long ago. And I was just exasperatedly waiting for that second album when the EP came out. So it's been a lot of waiting, but I haven't been too in love with any of his loose singles or album singles that predated this album. So it was kind of a wait and see thing for me, you know, stuff like uh, the parables and uh, gifted, which both have remixes on this album. Those songs are pretty old at this point. The original versions didn't do too much for me. I didn't think the EP was too special either. So definitely still in on the core day experience and the talent is evident, but yeah, it was definitely more of a wait and see album for me, which I wouldn't have expected to feel coming off of the lost boy because you know i still think that album really goes yeah lost boy we gave uh, i think a really warm uh reception to check that out youtube.com slash now nostalgia pod um after listening to from a bird's eye view i i left feeling like this was a really solid second album i think there's a lot to like i think there's some uh i think some of the production on this sounds really really great I think he raps really technically at points. Um, I think not all of it totally works for me, but I really enjoyed listening to from a bird's eye view. What was your general reception after first listen? Yeah, I think it's just okay. Honestly, I've found some of it just a little dull, a little boring, which is not what I wanted to hear. You know, I I don't think there's a broke as fuck or a lost and found or a RNP 
on this some songs that I still really adore from the Lost Boy. I just don't think the the tracks compare in, in the same way. And it's really funny to juxtapose this record with his LA Leakers freestyle he just did in promotion of this album. Because on that, you hear Corday rapping his ass off, going off, kicking the door. Fucking sounds great. But he doesn't rap too fucking hard on this, to be honest, the second album. And there, there's some moments of singing that I just, it's okay. It's not terrible, but it's just not really what I'm looking for. Because I know how technically proficient he is, and he just has an energy, too. He's not like a, a boring technical rapper by any means. And I just didn't think there's, en- there's enough songs here to, that I wanted to like spin again which is kind of frustrating. He, 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 Corday kind of feels like he's artistically stuck in the mud a little bit to me. And yeah. not that he's still, you know, he's at a high level already, so that's not the worst thing in the world, but I would like him to make some kind of progression because this, this just felt lesser to me than the first album. Yeah, I, I don't think it had the highs of the first album. I think, like you said, he has a really high level of output in terms of, Every song I think on here is competently made. I think it, it all sounds pretty good. I think it flows together fairly well, even. Um, but I don't think a lot of these have the replayability that you're talking about. So I agree with you on that. Um, I did enjoy, you know, just quite a few of um, like the the tracks early on. Like I thought um, Jean Michel, even though necessarily like the I don't know if like the lyrics I find super memorable, but I think just like the overall sound of the album, uh, of that track. And I think that the first couple, I really like Jean-Michel super, which has been a a single Mm. um, I really liked. And then uh, not mama's hood, but um, sorry, I guess a little later in the album, but C Carter, I thought was really good. Like a old school, like, growing up hip hop, like coming up what I dreamed of type song, which uh, I don't know that one, that one was probably the one I went back to most. Did you find any of those tracks as potential standouts? Yeah, I think super is pretty familiar as one of those like technical bars, banger Corday songs. That song's a few months old at this point. Pretty mm-hmm. solid. I like mama's hood uh, as well. I think that's him at his best lyrically. And yeah, I think for me, it just, it just kind of faded away for me. Like the album ending on Parables Remix and Gifted Remix. I mean, these songs aren't really good enough to oh. me to justify remixes in the first place. And in general, you know, I didn't really care for Corday singing on Chronicles. I thought the Dirk feature was pretty good, oh, but yeah. don't really love the song. Champagne Glasses, I just didn't think Corday was super ear catching on that and kind of wasting a, a, a Gibbs feature. So, I think it feels just more like a give song in general. Totally. And I guess for me, uh, the hook to, with uh, today featuring Gunna, I liked, you know, the, the mm-hmm. new Gunna album, we uh, intentionally did not review, but I thought Gunna fit that song pretty well. But yeah, I mean, I just, uh, this is, this is not like the, the next great Corday album. It's just, it, and to me, it's, it, it's anything more disappointing because he took his time to, to put this out. And it, it just felt like he kind of spun his wheels and had some diminishing returns, which kind of makes it feel even worse. You know, if he had put this out like barely a year after the Lost Boy, I wouldn't feel nearly the same, I don't think. But yeah. it's been a few years at this point, you know, and Lost Boy had two Grammy nominations and stuff. You know, I just want a little bit more at this point. It's interesting to to think about kind of like the lane he's in, right? Because uh, I think after Lost Boy, there was some speculation like, ah, is he going to be in that like J. Cole, Kendrick lane where, you know, really top tier rapping, uh, probably going to have a, a few classic albums. Um, and like you said, he's kind of been stuck in the mud creatively, maybe not leveling up the way that we were hoping. He's still pretty young, I think, right? He's like early he's, 20s, I think. Yeah, he's young. So there's still a lot of time for him to still have that output, but 24. I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily see him in that that Kendrick mold. Maybe more in like the J. Cole, like not gonna ever be like the most popular rapper, but put out just stuff that's really quality. Like a, a song like Coach Carter actually reminds me a bit of like a J. Cole. 
track, to be honest. Yeah, I think uh, Cole's definitely the best comp out of like the big three. But I mean, if he even sniffs Cole's popularity, he'd have a, uh, a very successful career. So it's a long yeah, way, for sure. uh, of course. But um, and he obviously very successful in life. He likes to talk about like his business pursuits and how he treats his money smartly. And of course, he's in a high profile relationship for some time now. But yeah, he made I, seven million last year. No, uh, no performances or whatever that line was no album out yeah didn't have to do a single fucking show uh, yeah exactly that's what it in. was yeah uh, you know just just don't 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 try and be drake man we, we don't need <laughs> no singing yeah it's not your thing everybody wants to sing now though that's the thing but uh, and that's what i think this was so it's so tantalizing is the la fleekers freestyle it's like ah it's right there i know he's got this <laughs> he just did it but like yeah. you just didn't make any songs that sound like this. I mean, it, it, besides the like super, the, the album isn't bad. And that that's the funny thing is, I think it's just like what we what we hoped we get and what we got is just not totally yeah. meet our expectations. But still, I think of a quality um, album, and we'll, we'll be putting out uh, probably a, one of those tracks that we mentioned onto our nostalgia best of twenty twenty two. Uh, I think it's time to move on to some greener pastures, though, Dave. And let's stay in the rap world with Earl Sweatshirt dropping sick. I don't know if that's <laughs> sick. Um, sick. However he puts it. Album four. But, man, tw- has it really been now four years since some rap songs? I guess really like three and a half. Yep. End of some 2018, some rap songs. End of 2019, Feet of Clay EP. So been some time. First release in the pandemic for Earl Sweatshirt, who is only 28 years old still. Been yeah. in our lives a long time, Earl. But this version of Earl is uh, only a few years old, as you say. The Some Rap Songs era, Earl. You know, uh, in, in reading up about this album, it was noted that he wanted to make a 17-track album that was a bit longer. This ended up only being about... 10 tracks, 24 yeah. minutes, pretty concise. Um, and if, if you even think about some rap songs, that album was known for it being chopped and screwed and very like short and quick. Uh, so what to expect from this album? Earl's always kind of evolving, looking different. Were you surprised at what Sick ended up being? No, and it's actually quite funny to me because I see a lot of reviews talking about the album in that way but this felt very familiar to me in the vein of some rap songs and feet of clay now i am not like the biggest fan of this version of earl i definitely prefer like doris version of earl so i don't run this stuff back all the time there's a lot of hardcore earl fans that do and they probably can speak to more of the differences more finely i think the obvious stuff is just the production is different but earl's like performance it still kind of feels a lot like what he's been doing lately these dense conscious raps overall it's this technical yet like hazy grim you know hip-hop that is not close to anything his other odd future compatriots have been up to obviously so this didn't really surprise me all that much, but how did you feel about it? Well, I, you know, I didn't really go in with a lot of expectations. I guess maybe I was expecting it to be a little bit more chopped and screwed and clunky in the best way, like some rap songs was at points. Uh, this definitely feels a little bit more, uh, I don't know, sparkly, uh, shiny in some sense, a little bit more polished. But overall, I, I came away from this just being like yeah earl is still really good uh i i really like a lot of the songs on here um i was mostly taken by the variety in the sounds that came from here it wasn't like he was he was going all over the map in terms of genre and uh i was overall really pleased with the record how did you feel about about sick though yeah i mean i liked it it's good uh I don't listen to a lot of the other people that Earl's been moving with the past few years, right? On this album, you get (laughs) Z Loopers and 
arm and hammer in the past you've got references to mike and yeah standing in the corner navy blue a lot of more underground uh but still well regarded east coast hip-hop for the most part so i don't really listen to this kind of stuff all that much but still you know i think there's a lot of songs to to enjoy and like you say there is a bit of variety on this which is again funny to think about because it's not like the most obvious stuff you kind of have to really be listening to. And, and I, I really enjoy the fact that some rap songs, Fida Clay and Sick are all very short because in terms of like total runtime, because there's still a lot of like density to the bars coming from Earl. So I think you it, it, it's helpful that there's more to more time to sit with the stuff because it does require that even if the, these songs in particular are not super long. Uh, but there's there's definitely some stuff I liked. Again, this avant-garde vein. I thought uh, quite easily my favorite song was Titanic, which is like the mm. closest Earl's come to like making a Vince Staples song in mm. in years. You know, Vince, obviously a good friend of his, Odd Future affiliate back in the day. The beat on Titanic mixed with Earl's storytelling on that definitely felt less stream of conscious than some of his other songs tend to tend to sound yeah titanic i think is a a clear standout it's getting a lot of love off this it's funny i think the tracks that stood out most all to me all came from the same producer which is maybe the biggest takeaway black noise Mm -hmm. um really i think had he popped off on four of the songs so there's a couple other producers the alchemist um ancestors on this as well but yeah, Black Noise produced um, 2010, Vision, Titanic, and Fire in the Hole, which uh, those two, those last two wrap up the album. Uh, 2010 is so, like, futuristic and, like, you know, has the rising and falling synths to it. And then Vision is, like, almost, like, futuristic trappy sounding. <laughs> it's, it's definitely uh, a weird mix, but... I think it really fits Earl's personality. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, Titanic is ab- absolutely great. And I think a clear a lyrical standout for Earl, like you said. Um, Fire in the Hole is probably my least favorite out of the four, but mm. still has those like spindly strings that really just yeah. like yeah. stand out. Definitely stood out. What other tracks did you like? Oh uh, yeah, I was going to mention Fire in the Hole specifically for those guitars or whatever, whatever kind of strings those were. Uh, but yeah, you said it. Vision, 2010, Titanic. I think those are the best ones. And uh, yeah, cool that Earl uh, seemed to put a lot of thought into this one. This is his second Warner album, second release since his uh, father passed. So it's been some time and he had been working on something completely different and he's really kind of switched it up to switch up what he had been up to to put this out. So that's pretty cool. Um but yeah, I, 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 of course, would definitely love Earl to continue to evolve and perhaps go back to the well a little bit. But I don't know. He seems to definitely march to the beat of his own drum, which is obviously very admirable. Yeah, no, he definitely does. Um, I just wanted to shout out a couple other tracks here as well. I really like Tabula Rasa. Uh, I thought that was uh, one of my favorites. And also, I liked the way that uh, lie, like the horns in that and then the horns in lobby which comes right after it were so different but felt kind of like of the same vein still just felt like a nice touch to the album for sure you mentioned it's been um the second album since his father passed and uh he he became a father i think since the last ep came out as well so it seems like the idea of like life and death is uh kind of central to some of the, the themes on this and yeah it, i think the thing we can say about earl is he's incredibly singular like no one really makes music like him um he's always evolving and uh, i really appreciate his artistry so uh enjoy listening to this want him to keep working hope we don't have to wait another couple of years to hear from him again but uh someone else like you mentioned earlier dropping from the cloud someone else we hadn't heard from um at least in album form in some time fka twigs capper songs man it's, it's a mixtape. I guess it's not an album, right? Her first mixtape. Yeah, definitely calling it a tape. Um, you know, we make a lot of 
jokes about like the mixtape definition at this point because everything's available on streaming everything's monetized so the difference between the album is way less evident than it used to be back in the day but i've had, come to understand that the mixtape meaning often has label implications in terms of contracts and stuff and you, you sometimes you have more creative freedom when you call something a mixtape and you know maybe it doesn't suit the uh, record record contracts requirements but you had more ability to do things with it now it seems like fk twigs calls this a mixtape not for any of those reasons but just because it's a lot looser and almost pop friendlier than her past uh you know alt r&b music which has been critically adored has been so and i think it does kind of make sense that it's like to the side of the fk twigs canon but to me it's still a very significant release yeah it's <laughs> It's funny when you when you think about mixtape and like you're I think really um, expertly laying out. Uh, you think about these it just kind of not being super cohesive, just kind of throwing stuff out there, and this definitely feels like that when you think about something like Magdalene from 2019. Oh, yeah. Magdalene, I think it's pronounced. Yep. Uh, so much more like cohesive and the the sound of it is all pretty singular but it really comes together well um and the themes obviously are there this jumps around from some of that like you know throwback sound but then you get uh a little bit more rapping on this some high-pitched yeah. rapping it reminded me a little bit of like tierra whack at times on this mm-hmm. you get some afro beat some dance hall even some asian influence she's all over the map some hyper pop like charlie xcx yeah. Oh, dude, she's definitely taken from Charlie XCX a few times on this. Uh, but the thing is, it's FK Twigs, and it all fucking works, and it all just sounds yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, it's funny. I've been thinking about FK Twigs a lot more recently because uh, her probably her best song ever, her biggest hit, Two Weeks, is just on TV in that uh, Swarovski commercial recently, yeah. like in the past few months. So you know, I've heard that a few times on TV, and I'm like, yeah, man, that song's so good. <laughs> be nice to get some fk twigs again this is our first release of any kind since uh the pandemic began but as you said magdalene critically adored uh one of the best albums in that stacked 2019 music here and i think it's cool to hear fk twigs kind of just letting loose having fun doing a lot of different stuff on this this mixtape because it is coming in the wake of more challenges and tribulations in her personal life in terms of her lawsuit against former boyfriend Shia LaBeouf for domestic abuse and everything that entailed with that. Of course, Magdalene was coming in the wake of very uh, serious, painful personal surgery, you know, and responding to how her public relationship with Robert Pattinson had uh, led to some online abuse for her. So she definitely seems to been going through a lot of shit in the past like five years i think it's cool to hear her have fun on something like this and kind of acknowledge that she's doing well and musically it's still very much i think strong creatively which makes it even better so it's really cool to see something like in that like mixtape form that seems to still blossom like this yeah uh, i think it's it's nice to just kind of hear her feeling uh, like she doesn't have to like uphold this image. I think that's one of the things that I think about with FKA Twigs up until this album is it always felt like the person she was portraying herself as on her albums, as an artist, as a, as a pop star, or very like finely crafted, finely tuned. And this just feels looser and a little bit more um, confident to just be who she is. Um, and I really loved hearing her just try stuff on this um you know something like uh poppy bones so dance hall um <laughs> sound, and she she was, is like the main producer on this uh with uh el gincho um mm-hmm. who uh is, is on a bunch of tracks but it's just so it, it feels almost like she just recorded it on her own and like put it out on soundcloud and sometimes or just like dropped it like it feels not as like finely tuned as everything else on Magdalene was, but it just is really fun. And uh, I think Shy Girl, who I'd never heard of, and her interplay, you know, pretty fun on that. Um, 
uh, I think it was a couple of tracks. It was, it was the next track or no, sorry, two tracks later, Jealousy, uh, clear Afrobeat song, just her going off, trying something else uh, with Rima. I think that really works too. It's like fun to listen to her try that and put on these different hats. And um, yeah, it was just cool to see her going all over the map on this. Yeah, totally. And, and not only is the, the variety, but the quality is still there. Like mm-hmm. you said, some Afrobeat, Jealousy with Rima, uh, definitely some light Afrobeat production there. But I thought Twigs like spazzed on the chorus on that song. Sounds great. Um, conversely, what's the song? How do you say it? Pa- Papal Mouse? Pa- 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 Pample Moose. Pa- Pample Mouse, which is a really short track, but clearly hyper pop production. And then at the yeah. end of that, she kind of references her unreleased Dua Lipa collab and kind of poking fun at the uh hype i don't want to listen to it on youtube anymore (laughs) yeah (laughs) which uh led me to doing the same (laughs) yeah so and then again on the other side of things you have the lead single tears in the club featuring the Mm. weekend crazy good bass yep amazing pre-chorus really fun catchy as hell song very catchiest song she's ever made great music video too it, it, uh, that song gonna say, blows me away honestly yeah it's a really great song and abel obviously just operating yeah. on the highest level right now no, so no it's so cool away from the together. weekend either it fits the song well he's there for the video like everything's there yeah you know i never would have like thought of putting them together but it really makes so much sense like <laughs> i don't know i never really thought of that pairing before cool. um yeah and i think she also put out i I didn't watch it yet but a music video for ride the dragon the first track on this too it's like really like like, lo-fi like on the streets like tiktok stuff awesome and and i i really love like how weird this song is obviously Mm -hmm. there's some like asian influence to the song but like having the like call and response of like the super distorted like growling vocals back and forth um the song switching up with like the cassette sound every once in a while uh beat kind of coming in and out i thought that was really interesting and well done and that's kind of like the weird fk twigs you expect Mm. but it still just sounds really really fun hell yeah yeah i'd also like to acknowledge uh, oh my love i thought that post chorus Mm. in particular from twigs definitely gave me more of a a tanache vibe the everybody knows part in particular Everybody knows you want my love or whatever it goes. Uh, and then also light beamers, yeah. crazy vocal effects on that, but still really high energy. Yeah. Uh, again, the, the variety in sounds and production is so evident by writing performance as well. But this is really fun. Obviously, there's a lot of songs here. It's uh, 17 songs, 48 minutes. So not everything's like amazing, that. but the, the variety definitely makes up for it. You know, uh, one of the songs that was a clear standout to me in the best way possible and then maybe in one of the most disappointing ways possible was Darjeeling yeah. because I love that song up until Unknown T comes in. And then I don't know why, but something about his feature just did not work for me on it. Twigs doing but, drill, UK drill. <laughs> yeah, and Twigs and Georgia Smith both sounding just mm. impeccable and playing off each other so well yeah. on this. Um, they didn't need uh, Unknown T. No, Uh, apparently Georgia Smith is a songwriter on the unreleased Dua Twigs collab mm -hmm. as well. Cool stuff. Interesting. Definitely, for sure. Anything else on here you want to shout out? No, I mean, we just shouted out like seven songs. (laughs) I think it's real good. Yeah, it is real good. And I was thinking about this because, you know, you you get early, get FKA, two people that made our uh, best music of the year in 2018, 2019, respectively pretty early in the year to be putting out these albums that could potentially be in uh in, you know not to mention the weekend year. last week yeah, i know like if this is the music year we're gonna get like every year every week should be a banger uh i'll oh, yeah. take it yeah absolutely absolutely no complaints here we got uh <laughs> more stuff coming earth gang end of the month charlie xcx in march hell yeah um check out our now Best of 2022 like we talked about, give us a follow there. And also if you're on Spotify, just uh, hop over to our uh, podcast page and give us a five-star rating and review. All right. It's they don't do reviews. Week. It's just ratings. 
that's true but you can still review us if you want to just tell your friends about us uh we're gonna hop over to tv where james gunn hopping from the big screen to little screen but staying in the same lane as we last saw him with the suicide squad last year peacemaker john cena's character in, in that movie uh villain you know turned villain in the movie totally uh r.i.p flag <laughs> yeah oh man well when they w- went through that in the beginning i just was like joel kinnaman my guy uh all over again uh, by the way i've been watching for all of mankind and he's great Dude, i gotta start it so i gotta yeah, start yeah. it the season yeah, two on. hype is high it's it's good it's good anyways uh john cena playing peacemaker uh on hbo max yeah dave uh this is getting a lot of love three episodes dropped this past week what do you what did you think of these first couple episodes i enjoyed it i enjoyed it quite a bit i think it has a lot of the things you'd hope this show would have as a james dunn creation as a the suicide squad spinoff namely tone comedy and i think really importantly uh certain self-awareness with its themes and what it's trying to achieve and that's really great. You know, the, the Peacemaker character played by John Cena, a big part, an important part, one of the best parts of the Suicide Squad last year. And I think a big part of that is Cena's really good performance. You know, I think John Cena, as the actor, does have strong comedy chops, but is also not afraid to, you know, ugly himself up or make himself look stupid in a way that the rock still won't touch right oh yeah yep and he did this to great effect in the film huge heel turn towards the end there becoming a true villain you really hate him at the end the way you know flag goes down and everything but then that post credit scene sets up this show and it's actually kind of brilliant because there's just so much meat on the bone with what the peacemaker character is lampooning thematically and yeah, this does this show have the same budget as the Suicide Squad? Certainly not. And if they did make a, a second show, it also isn't getting that budget after the box office performance of the Suicide Squad. Yeah. Alas, all the thematic stuff's still there. So I just find it really enjoyable and a nice, you know, kind of change of pace from what we've come to expect from the saturated superhero TV market. This isn't totally new from DC, the Doom Patrol show the DC Universe switch to HBO Max show kind of has a similar way it treats superhero culture. But it's really cool to see this in like that DCEU space with even Gunn himself being the driving force and Cena still there too. So uh, I, I think it's successful. Yeah, I definitely think it's successful. It's um, very much getting compared to things like the boys on Amazon, you know, yeah. like the superhero genre. It's It's gritty but it's really uh, critiquing and, and putting a spin of realism onto uh, the, the world of superheroes. Um, I thought, I, I, I want to say just for transparency, I only got through the first episode. Uh, I actually didn't realize that all three dropped. So that's, that's just my bad, not doing my Yeah, like thing. Station Eleven seems to be yeah. the HBO Max release strategy of late. But then again, they're only doing one a week from here on out. Station Eleven did two up until the finale. So yeah, HBO Max definitely experimenting more than traditional hbo does yeah and i and I, I don't hate it either keep giving us three episodes i can't wait to watch the next two um i i thought the first episode was dynamite i thought it really introduced a lot of it obviously introduced the team around peacemaker um you get viola davis uh obviously <laughs> uh just you know uh, uh not on location just somewhere in her house recording this shit i was surprised and, to even see her do zoom though you know? Me too. Honestly, I was I was shocked we actually saw her, um, and yeah, I mean it, it's it is a good mix of fun uh, with I think some meta commentary on what Peacemaker is supposed to represent in terms of like America and like American values or right. what we people see American values as. Um, also, get some pretty fun action near the end of it as well mm-hmm. as some uh, some nudity, which I just was like not expecting at all. It was kind of like oh didn't know that it was this kind of show so yeah maybe raunchier than we're than i was expecting and uh i loved eagly so yeah. shout out to eagly yeah eagly uh fantastic cgi especially for a show yeah. it looks really great 
really <laughs> realistic. Uh, hats off to the animators there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I just love how game Cena is. Again, like yeah. he's just he's just great in the role, and he's not afraid to do anything ridiculous. Yep. And like he he obviously is in on the joke. He understands what's going on, but like you still need the performer to be there, and he is. Um, you know, episode two, you get the vigilante character called vigilante continues this you know lampooning theme specifically about police officers and uh some of the cultural talking points you might hear around the act of policing as well as vigilanteism so uh i think it's all like sometimes it's on the nose but even when it is it's still funny and amusing so i don't mind and i'm looking forward to seeing you know where it goes and i think plot like the plot's basically irrelevant to me because I'm just right. enjoying the overall commentary. So if it, if it continues to be uh, fun and having you know, some decent action episode to episode, good enough for me. Yeah, one of the things I really appreciate about this is uh, Gunn wrote all this after the Suicide Squad in the pandemic. So, And this is something that came to him quick, apparently, from the interviews he's done, that this story kind of came to him. So it seems like there's some real inspiration some vision with this and uh, i really like uh, at least from the first episode again i haven't seen the others the way that the team around him is just totally like disgusted by him and just thinks he's a complete <laughs> buffoon the scene in the restaurant when he shows up in uniform and they're just like you wore the fucking uniform and he's even wearing the helmet and he won't take it off for like so long oh man uh, it calls the, the waitress sweet cheeks doesn't understand how that's inappropriate um and then him in the parking lot talking about how big his penis is call them uh third like chimp arm or something like that or third arm whatever yeah uh, yeah <laughs> in elementary school just ridiculous stuff um and then following that up with the uh, that ending fight scene at the end of episode one uh great dramatic uh stunts and seeing cena get whipped around by this you know 100 pound girl or a woman was just uh really fun to watch so there's a lot to like with this show i think a lot to sink your teeth into i don't i probably not a show for everybody i think if you're definitely not more than that marvel if you really like the marvel shows and you're like ah marvel's it you're really not going to vibe with the the grittiness or the commentary that this is going for Right, totally. Yeah, it definitely just has different goals. I'm interested to see what the future uh, HBO Max DCEU spinoff shows attempt to achieve. You know, we know there's the Gotham City Police Department series spinoff from Matthew Reeves upcoming. The Batman film, that show's supposed to be a prequel. That show's been taking longer to come to fruition recently switched showrunners. On top of that, they recently announced a Penguin spin-off series with Colin Farrell reprising his role so they're definitely still making these shows but probably going to be some time before we get something else post peacemaker but nevertheless just happy it's there the the funny thing is DC shows we know that they can do shows pretty well the animated shows at least have been successful with the comics and uh, I think they can definitely get some big name people to be doing these shows gun and reeves alone are huge gets for the small screen so yeah i don't think i think reeves is too involved in this series but either way i mean they're spinning off from his thing um yeah uh i mean dc it doesn't please everyone but they're just kind of doing things here and there and for the most part they're making good stuff uh, as of late so you know i don't have anything too bad to say about them we know the bat girl with leslie grace uh, HBO Max feature film is coming perhaps the end of this year so uh, I think I, I like where they're headed even if you know Henry Cavill fans may not be happy <laughs> yeah well uh, we're gonna be staying tuned to Peacemaker we'll talk about it when it wraps up in a few weeks drop your thoughts below let's stay on HBO though Station Eleven dropping uh <laughs> i just saw the, the picture you chose for this just made me laugh uh okay. <laughs> HB, uh hbo's i guess like big breakout show station 11 finishing up its one season it's only season yeah uh, many based off the book um this past weekend and man what a surprise and what a delightful ride this was i was uh talking with friend of the pod sean mckenna today who was asking 
what what TV I'm watching, asking for some recommendations. I said, you're a fan of the leftovers. I also know that he was a fan of the early seasons of The Walking Dead. I said, if you mash those two things together, take kind of the premise of The Walking Dead, but with the ambition of the leftovers, yeah. this is what you got with Station Eleven. Featuring a leftovers alumnus at the helm in Patrick Somerville. Yes. Yeah. Perfect marriage. And, and I gotta say, Station Eleven, um, completely satisfying 10 episode uh, miniseries and man it, i just hate that it came at this time of year because it's like it probably should have been on our best tv of last year and now it's probably going to be forgotten in the best tv this year and i just want to talk about it more this is so much fun yeah uh i mean i'm definitely putting it on the 2022 list in part because it didn't end until the 2021 list was done uh yeah t- tough timing for lists but um, I think people are going to really ride for it, rightfully so, because it's just a really successful, high-level show. I'm not, I wasn't familiar with the book, but the book was very successful, very well-liked. So there was a bit of hype going in for people in the know. But either way, what's so great about this is that it's, it's everything The Walking Dead isn't. You know, It's not Why the Last Man. This is a show that doesn't give a flying fuck about plot because it's not important to the series. The goals of the show, the goals of the storytelling do not involve major plot. And that's really awesome because it's executed on so well. The journey you go on with the characters, really expert juggling of multiple timelines, flashbacks, flash forwards, etc. Everything just really works and hits hits successfully on these core emotional, these core character beats. And yeah, do you have questions about how things happen and what things could happen? Absolutely, because the world is so finely drawn that you just want to learn more. And if you even think about macro view, what is Station Eleven about? It's about a group of people in a few different locations around Lake Michigan. That's it. This whole premise of how Station Eleven begins with a, a flu knocking out 90 whatever percent of the world's population. Yeah, I mean, there's some questions. What else is going on in other locations, right? But no, that's not what the show is about. It's about these specific people that really just kind of stick around in the same area. And because the characters are so well developed, it doesn't matter that there's no like plot ambition because it's completely irrelevant yeah man it where i think you you spelled it out in a really great way because when even if you go listen to our uh review of the first couple episodes of the show um we talked about like ah, i can't wait to see like how this propels this forward or where Mackenzie davis is really going with this and Mm -hmm. you know you had uh david uh zavato or daniel zavato as the prophet right yeah, and tyler uh, yeah and tyler and you're kind of like oh, he's this fill in like very like ominous character and what it really ends up being is a meditation on the the human experience and the need we have for community and other people yeah. and how we deal with loss and grief and just so many different themes even themes about like authorship and stealing authorship or what it means mm. to be known as the author of something you know and uh i think notably like a black woman like having her work kind of be credited to somebody else in the show <laughs> um just uh to me was incredibly like thought-provoking and kind of in what it was trying to say and the thing is like every single character you end up caring about no matter how much time you spend with them like when you first meet Frank in the first couple episodes, mm. you're like, he's a dick. Like he didn't want to let his brother yeah. and this girl in as the world's ending. Like we wanted to like get them out as fast as possible. And then you get the episode where Mackenzie Davis has this like fever dream remembrance of her time with Frank and um, uh, J- Javine. J- Javin. Javin. Thank you. Um, and it just totally changes your, your perspective. And no character in this is totally good or totally bad that's it's so fully drawn for everybody and really uh really impressive um i wanted to like 
zoom in a little bit on some of the characters or moments that you you found yourself appreciating most or most uh, taken by any any performances that you really liked let's start there yeah, I liked a lot of the performances. I think a lot's been made of episode three, which was released at the start. Daniel yeah. Deadweiler's performance as Miranda. I think that's where the show really takes off and you kind of understand like what's going on at Station Eleven as like an enterprise because going to this completely new location, learning about this completely, to this point, an unknown character to this core group. And you're like, what, what's going on here? There's nothing to do with the traveling symphony. symphony. Like what's, what's happening? And just a really, I think, masterful job there. I also was really taken with uh, episode five. Yeah, where you get the, the Severn City Airport. Correct, where you get get the you get the airport speech from David Wilman from Clark, and then this whole episode was written by Cord Jefferson, of course, Emmy winner for uh, Watchmen. But that episode being the origin story of the prophet, why Tyler becomes who he becomes and you might even see coming half of the episode but like you just don't care because it's done so well um i think both the kid playing young tyler as well as daniel zavato as tyler as you said it is really doing like impressive stuff apparently tyler's a bit more sinister of a figure in the novel and obviously there's some questions about how the undersea works and maybe even how he uh, Tyler communicated the uh, stand down to his child warriors at the airport at the end there. Regardless, the performance is really strong. So I definitely agree about Frank as well. Um, I, I thought everyone was really up to the task and because like, these characters are like very specific, but now there's, there's no like clear archetypes here. Like even like uh, Sarah, the head of the symphony played by Lori Petty, like really specific, like really kind of, out of left field performance you know a very neurotic person yeah. like everyone's bringing it oh absolutely um yeah I, I appreciate that you shouted out david wilman i thought he was fantastic um you know himesh patel uh really surprised me at this uh, you know i think after yesterday yesterday being a fairly disappointing and problematic at times movie mm-hmm. um and really only seeing him in small roles and things like don't look up or tenant yeah. Um, it, I was like, is he going to end up being someone that was kind of tapped to be this like leading man and never going to really fully reach that potential? But man, he he brings it in this, and you you kind of get him in, in. You get a lot of him in the first episode, then in uh, you know snips uh, or, of memory here and there for uh, right. Kirsten, and then uh, what was episode seven, or, and then mm. or it was eight and nine, seven or seven or nine, I can't remember which one exactly. But um, where you, you see a little bit more about them, like, or seven, uh, sorry. Yeah, seven. Um, Goodbye, my damaged home. That was just a absolutely uh, amazing episode, I thought, and really built him out. And then you see him in episode nine, Dr. Chaudhary, mm-hmm. um, where he, you know, he, the picture that you have right there, and he gets taken in as uh in this furniture store which i thought was like a brilliant like if you're end of the world of course go to a furniture store makes a lot of sense i feel like yeah. um but like and then gets pulled in to be this doctor loses his foot or i guess his toes that sort of thing uh he just blew me away and then you get that final scene between him and Mackenzie davis uh where they finally make their way back to each other and man i thought that was just incredibly satisfying and moving and it said so much without them actually saying anything um, which mm. great choice by Patrick Somerville. Um, yeah. So he, him and of course, Mackenzie Davis is always good. She's, she's really great. Yeah. I was um, actually kind of surprised to see them reunite. I wouldn't have been surprised if they just missed each other at the airport there. Like it just didn't happen, you know, um, but like they pay off everything just right. They do have that reconnection Kirsten Kier- and Jeevan and then we'll meet again airport getting added to the wheel but alex gets to go off on her own and you know before clark dies kirsten explains who she was as a little kid like the the level of connection is actually pretty funny um because it it might seem circumstantial but then you kind of realize like no all these people are just in the same location basically the whole time so it does kind of make sense i guess 
but um, I, I just feel like everyone was really cool. And um, on top of that, you have some really choice, like needle drops in episode nine at the end, you had the TLC uh, creep drop very yep. notably with all the moms dancing and stuff like that. <laughs> that was cool. Uh, obviously Frank rapping uh, tribe in episode yeah. seven, right before shit hits the fan. Love that. Um, at the end of episode nine, of course, as the credits are about the roll, you hear more tribe with can I kick it? Um, but I, I, I'm again, I'm just really taken with how the breakdown of society is not, not, not the point, you know, it's yep. about connection and, and like something even smaller, like the power of art, you know, and like what matters and finding value in, the past versus what's to come and you know a different show would explain who the red bandanas are yeah. but station 11 doesn't because it doesn't need to doesn't matter yeah um I, I i think the moments that i'm probably going to look back and be most impressed by this is my guess now i mean i hope to a, a chance to rewatch this at some point we watch so much stuff rewatching isn't usually uh something we can do but it's just like the small lines between each other like in the final episode um you know as they're d- talking before they go their separate ways kirsten says to jeevan i never felt scared with you and it's like such a simple way of really saying like you know you were home to me in a way i had never had or i had during this really tumultuous time in all of our lives um and it's just so like simple and well written and something someone actually like might say. <laughs> and uh, you know, Jeevan doesn't really say that much back to her. He just kind of like, I was always scared. <laughs> and it it's just says so much in that moment about like parenthood and um, you know, like the the dynamics of being a caretaker and uh expertly written, expertly acted, incredibly well crafted. I also just want to shout out the uh, Hamlet scene between uh, oh, yeah. Tyler and his mom and uh, Clark so fucking powerful and so well acted and absolutely riveting I, I thought that the way that that was shot and the drama of it all you know uh, Kirsten making the decision not to like intervene mm. perfect beautiful all the double meaning of the dialogue is so choice you know yeah and like it's it's built up to it. it's like no this is a group that performed Shakespeare and the very first scene in the whole show is uh Bernal dying to King Lear so like it all <laughs> it all makes sense and yet like you get this like all this double meaning it's really great shout out to uh, Matilda Lawler as young Kirsten Re- really really yeah. impressive for a, a young actress she was tremendous it's kind of funny to see she definitely aged in a significant way physically because of mm-hmm. course the show started and then paused with the pandemic and as a little kid you can see the aging process a little bit mm-hmm. but regardless she was really great yeah, I, I just want to shout out one more acting moment, which is uh, Daniel Deadweiler doing the uh, making the phone call to the yeah the cockpit Huge man moment. Uh, the way that she delivers those lines and just like the meta commentary on what we've all gone through in this past year and a half. I wonder if that was written after COVID started or like sometime right. after. Yeah, I don't know the book well enough to say. <laughs> uh it's so so powerful and uh yeah i thought i thought she was just great all the time that she got and of course you get timothy simons just kind of like being her little sidekick which he's mm-hmm. he's always like fun to watch so happy to see uh, david cross showed up for a little bit which was nice right yeah <laughs> the landmine thing was funny because like i feel like he, he set these up and then they just ran straight through there's <laughs> just a straight through line through these landmines um anything else you want to say about station 11 nope it's it's really great and yeah seems like the word is getting out and you know hbo max you know there's all this talk about when hbo max came to be oh well it, will it dilute the hbo brand well you know what the shows that hbo proper doesn't make that still live on hbo max shows like hacks made for love and now station 11 uh, so far so good the hbo brand is not being sullied these shows are no. great <laughs> uh dave why don't we why don't we move on though and finish up with a movie that you were able to make it go see anime bell tell me about this yes so bell is the latest feature film from mamoru husada from his studio he founded studio chizu husada's last film came out 2018 mirai 
a Murray forget. And Murray was Oscar nominated for Best Animated Feature, becoming the first non-Studio Ghibli anime film to receive such a designation. It, of course, lost the Spider-Verse. But Hosada is a huge, uh, long-standing anime veteran uh, storied career. This is his latest film, and it got by far the widest uh, release in the U.S. of any of his films to date. And this is, of course, on the heels of a premiere at Cannes last year of release in Japan. Last year was the third highest grossing film in Japan in 2021. But just got a release uh, from G Kids, as most anime films do, and did pretty good business. But honestly, I would definitely recommend this film uh, enthusiastically because I think it's a really smart modern day adaptation slash interpretation of Beauty and the Beast. Modern day in the sense that the subject, uh, we're, we're saying the, you know, the present day, but we have this uh, metaverse type situation called you. It's kind of like the matrix where everyone has their own personal anonymous avatars. They can do all these things like TikTok stuff and interacting and, you know, everything. It's basically all social media in one thing where you have your own, you know, avatar and stuff like that. And our lead character, Suzu, has her uh, avatar called Belle, where she becomes this uh, kind of famous singer, almost the way someone will blow up on TikTok for being good at something, right? And uh, Suzu actually is a uh, Japanese translation for that would uh, be to Belle, funny enough. And it becomes a bit of a Beauty and the Beast uh, analog because there's this beast figure, as you can imagine, also in our uh, U-verse here. And I think what's, what's really impressive about the film and, is that it's so overstuffed with themes, specifically like themes about uh, processing grief and online bullying and having self-confidence and even stuff like uh, domestic abuse. There's a lot of stuff going on here beyond the usual beats you associate with Beauty and the Beast, the story. And it doesn't have enough time, I think, to service all these themes. It has a lot of ambition. So not everything feels like everything feels like there was more meat on the bone here, but all the I think all the characters surrounding uh, Suzu, all like their you know real life counterparts and everything, uh, all those character relationships really make sense. I think there's a lot of really well handled tender moments here, and when you go into like that met, that met universe, the animation is really crazy but still really beautiful, and. I was pretty pretty impressed, honestly, just with kind of like the thematic ambition of our story in terms of uh, what what it's setting out to do. So I would definitely recommend Bell. Um, you know, it, it, it's definitely a lot grander than just Beauty and the Beast. And I think towards the end, even some of the stuff happening in you is perhaps less interesting than what's happening to the characters uh, actually in the real world. But uh, I think there's still a lot to uh, recommend about it. It's, it sounds really fascinating. And, you know, when you first said, uh, you know, modern day beauty and beast, I kind of was like, ah, I don't know about this. And then the way you described it, it sounds like it's a lot more like thoughtful and exploring some really uh, important themes of modern day. So that's really yeah, cool. Totally. And totally. the animation looks fantastic. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. It's uh, really remarkable. And yeah, I think just the, the the movie has a, a lot to say. And does it say something super profound about all those things? Not necessarily, but uh, it has a lot of uh, important beats, I would say. And the Beauty and the Beast, you know, obvious logline there is really just part of it, not really the main thing. So pretty cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll definitely check it out whenever I can. But we're going to wrap up there for today. What do we got for next week, Dave? Yeah, I got a lot of good stuff coming up for next week. Uh, Asghar Farhadi's film A Hero hits Amazon Prime. That's the Iranian Best International Film Oscar submission, uh, heavily expected to be nominated there. We'll also be talking about After Yang at Sundance. Shout out Sundance going all online once again this year. Very excited to talk about that film. Uh, Aziz Ansari back with another Netflix comedy special on Tuesday. Very excited about that. Uh, some music from Years and Years, Ian Dior. I've seen Drive My Car 
remarkable film. Hopefully Pat will as well. We're going to talk about that. The best. Yeah. Uh, HBO's show, The Gilded Age is coming out. A lot of good stuff coming up. You know, the, the dry content mines of January are no more in 2022. Uh, shout out to the content gods for that. Uh, follow us at Nostalgia Pod on Twitter, SoundCloud.com slash Nostalgia Pod, but more importantly, YouTube.com slash Nostalgia Pod and that five star review on Spotify. We'll catch you next week.